Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. We are going to be here talking today about, well, I guess this is our final HFES bonus episode. Uh, we've actually been sitting on this audio for a little bit. Um, this happened, what, I guess, late Wednesday night. and uh, It was deep into the evening for sure. It was it was pretty deep into the evening. We had a couple people over at my hotel room, and we just said, let's have a podcast. And because, uh, look, one thing we did while we were out was, um, well, obviously we did all the interviews, but I, I think one thing that was missing or that a lot of people have been asking for is, hey, where's your normal coverage? You usually say like, hey, what panels did you go to? Uh, what kind of cool things did you see at the conference? And to be honest, I mean, Blake, you and I were stuck at interviews. Like, and not, not that that's a bad thing, but we were literally interviewing every day for large chunks that we couldn't get out and see anything. Yeah, and then we had a few problems, like just making sure we were getting the content uploaded and stuff like that. So we had to spend a lot of time doing some of our like post show stuff. But besides going to pan or instead of going to panels, yeah, and it was it was a much bigger operation this year because we had to inter- uh, we had to interact with people as well and organize scheduling and uh, a lot of that kind of took away from our ability to go to panels. Um, so we hope what you hear here in a couple minutes, you'll you'll hear that Wednesday night. Um, conversation it's cut and clipped a lot because as you know a conversation can happen when you have five people in a room uh tangents can come up so i mean like we cut out talks about amazon drones and um uh, what else was there elevators lots Uh, of like nonsense about elevators the difference between human factors scientists versus engineers like yeah we went like philosophical conversations all over the place yeah it was it was a lot so what we did was we tried to condense we had what two hours of audio we condensed it down to 40 minutes that's just all about hfes um uh, before we get there, Blake, though, I we've had, I guess, a week now, two weeks. How much? How long has it been? It's been a it's week. It's been two weeks, I guess. All right, yeah. How how are you feeling about the whole HFES experience? Um, I know we might re-say some of the things that were in that audio. That's fine. I just want to check sure. in with you. How were how was HFES for you? Or so you know? it, w- it was really cool, and maybe it, it's it's kind of funny for me. You'll hear me say in the audio that I've actually never been to HFES. Uh, and it's that's technically not true, and Nick does correct me. I mean, I went for one day once to help somebody edit the newsletter, and I never went to any sessions, did any of that stuff, met up with some of my friends, and that was my only experience with HFES. And so it was cool to get to go in the capacity that we were able to go. We And Nick and I have talked about this a little bit outside of the podcast. Like We really felt like we got rock star treatment in a lot of ways because we're sitting yeah. there giving interviews to the people that – in my case, definitely in the case of like Nancy Cook and Mike Ansley, I was reading their papers when I was in grad school. And it was one of those things that like going and working for somewhere like SA Technologies was a big deal. So it was it was really just a mind numbing and sometimes mind blowing experience to be sitting there talking to people about their work. And it was one right after the other. It was literally, hey, talk to this really influential name. Hey, talk to this next one. Uh, and some of the conversations we had both on and off camera were were great. Um, and, oh yeah. And yeah, I, I have to echo it, Blake. I mean, like for us, it, it was, uh, not the traditional experience. Right. So I feel like we don't really have that much in the way of, of, uh, uh, opinions to, to offer to our listeners. And, and that's really unfortunate. That's one thing that I do miss, right. Is being able to, uh, kind of have boots on the ground for, you know, a, as an analogy to be in the thick of some of these presentations. And I mean, we, I was able to go to one, exactly one. And I mentioned it in, um, in this conversation, but, um, so with all that being said, because we got this sort of, I'm going to keep using that phrase rockstar treatment, because that's kind of what it felt like. Um, we did solicit the help of two others, right? Logan, uh, who you've heard on the show before Logan was, uh, was uh he he helped us out last hfes he talked about the toyota factory tour and then um also more recently he helped us break down ahfe uh so so you know logan's voice bailey uh who was also on the podcast here um she was our volunteer and it was kind of funny because we were trying to figure out how much help we would need and uh you know i i 
I want to say two things. One, thank you, Bailey, for your help. I felt really bad that she didn't really have a whole lot to do because we kind of figured out our process by Wednesday night when she tried to help us out. Sure, yeah. Um, so we invited her on the podcast to kind of talk about her experience that day. And uh, so that's so she's there. I also want to bring up another point, too. If you're listening to this, um, thank you, first of all. Second off, if you are looking for a volunteer opportunity to get involved, um, I think I cut this out of our interview here, but uh, I want to say it up front here, five minutes in. If you're listening to this and you want to get involved, let us know. We do this completely free of charge. Like everything that we do here on the show is out of our pocket, um, including, you know, the the stuff for HFES. All that's out of pocket uh, with a little bit of support from HFES, the organization. So if you want to get involved and help us out, let us know. We'll find something for you. Like there's a website that we need to update. Badly, um, yeah. Yeah, there's, you know, there's uh, a ton of other opportunities that we can, I'm sure, think of helping us find news for the week, what's new, interesting, exciting in the field. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities. So ev- it's not even a full-blown internship. It would literally just be a volunteer work. Um, but we are more than happy to, you know, if you, if you do good work, we're more than happy to put your name out there. So um, please reach out to us if, if you want some of these opportunities. Uh, with that, I think we'll turn it over to this conversation. Um, so if it sounds a little cropped up and, and choppy in places, I tried to do my best to make the conversation flow naturally. Even. It sounded really good when we listened to it back, so <laughs> I, I don't think most people won't notice it, but hopefully they enjoy the conversation. Hopefully they enjoy it. So, all right, here you go, guys. This is our conversation from HFES 2018. What was your favorite thing so far? So, this might just be some recency bias, but I actually attended a presentation earlier today. It was really fascinating. It was a, um, a graduate student from, I want to give credit where I, if I can, I forget exactly which university it was from, uh, but he was breaking down uh, an evaluation of gesture-based and eye movement-based interfaces. Um, and he systematically evaluated combinations of gesture-based and eye movement-based interfaces, so like a pure eye-based interface. So like you look at something, and if you look at it for long enough, it selects it, then you move it, and if you look at the folder for long enough, it places it there. And then combination, and then a gesture-based interface, so you just you reach over, grab it, move it, place it. And then a combination interface where you, where you select it by closing your hands, and then you move it with your eyes. Um, and uh, several other really unique combinations. It was a really well-designed study, and the presentation was absolutely dynamic. So um, it, w- it was really, really well well put together. So that, that's probably been my, my biggest highlight at this point. Um, again, might just be some recency bias, but it was really fascinating to hear, see him break that down. So for you, what really made that presentation so dynamic or good? So a lot of times, and I'm, I'm very guilty of this, it's easy to fill up a PowerPoint with just a bunch of text, like an outline, just bullet point after bullet point after bullet point, and you're oh, yeah, sitting we're there. guilty of that for sure. Yeah, and it's like you're sitting there, like you're almost reading the paper but on a, a slide, and I, I get that. We're in a really information-rich domain, and it's, it's, it's hard to try to convey things without having all that text. But what was really interesting is I think he only had, like, he had one slide where he listed off some very, like, very brief points. But aside from that, it was all just visuals to augment what he was saying. Everything he was saying was coming straight out of his head. And the visuals were just there to, as, as examples or to augment what he was saying. It was, it was actually it was a really cool approach. I, I think that's a great presentation skill to have is, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're all guilty of listing these, um, these presentations and having tons of text. But to be able to uh, to just see a picture or a single word and to be able to um, kind of go off that and play off that, it, I mean, it really is a great skill to have um, in in the real world. So oh yeah, that's, definitely. That, that I can definitely see how that'd be a good presentation. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird that that's the highlight at this point because I, I mean, I've had all these incredible, a bunch of incredible conversations. Like earlier today, we had posters with fellows, and I got to talk with some of my research heroes. But that's just kind of stuck out in the back of my head. It's like, wow, that's a great example of. Human factors applied to a human factors presentation. It's human yeah. factories. <laughs> human factors inception, I guess you could say. Like, I, I feel like that's what this conference should be about, is like us being able, and anybody in the field being able to display that on, the, on that basis. Yeah. So like when I'm going to these conference sessions today, I was falling asleep in them. Like no offense to the people who are presenting today, but like I, I didn't get a chance to go to the gaze and, and eye tracking one. But yeah. um, at some point I was like, why aren't we displaying what we study? 
And it should be in everything. It should be in the lanyards that you have on your neck. Like today, no one could read because I'm super short. And I'm like, it's all the way down here. It's like, why, why are we having problems with just getting to know my name? So I ended up just like pinning it on myself. But like, it should be down to the down to the little things that we should be able to present what we study. Um, so that's a good point, though. Presentation skills are good. <laughs> <laughs> so Logan, what were some low lights for you? Low lights, well. Wow. It's kind of hard to, it's almost like asking what were the lowlights of your Christmas? Like, at least for me, <laughs> like, that's this is an amazing this analogy. Is, that sweater. I mean, but even the sweater has some charm to it. Like, it's like, I, I mean, they're like, like what you said, as much as I love human factors, like there are some presentations where I, I find myself in a session where I was in there for one or two presentations that are very close to what I work with. And then the last couple presentations are like they're in a different area that I'm not quite as familiar with or something like that. Um, so I guess that would probably be the closest thing to a low light, but it's, it's again, it's kind of, this feels like I was on the phone with my parents um, and my girlfriend a little while back um, earlier this week. And I was telling them like, this feels like Christmas. Every time I'm at this conference, it feels like it's like, it's a weird kind of nerdy Christmas where we get to talk about the stuff we're interested in. And everyone that we see is a human factors person in one way or another. And, it's, it's it's kind of a, I don't know, it's, it's hard to define a low light, it's as weird as that sounds. You said, like, one thing that I think you're only ever going to get at, like, a human factors conference, and that's saying, like, you got to meet some of your research heroes. Yeah. So who were a few of those people? Wow. So let's just go through, then. Wow. Um, well, one of the big ones uh, that I, I had a chance to meet, actually, interestingly enough, is at my... Um, my university, my undergraduate uh, institution, University of Central Florida, uh, but I didn't get a chance to chat with him a whole lot because he's arguably one of the busiest people is uh, Dr. Peter Hancock. So mm. I got to uh, speak with him very briefly today, which was, that was very cool. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of some of the other people I talked with. I talked with uh, Doug Gillen. Um, he's absolutely fascinating. He was uh, discussing some of the work he's been doing, actually analyzing human factors textbooks and looking at how do we present the key human factors concepts to students and how does that maybe influence or reflect uh, how we how we think about the field going forward. Gotcha. Yeah, so it, it was cool getting to, getting to chat with people. It was It's definitely a, a fun, unique experience. That's awesome. Are we interviewing Peter Hancock later this week? Tomorrow. Oh, yes. oh yeah. Fun. We'll be talking That's to exciting. him tomorrow. So I, I I find it fascinating, Logan, that you don't, have any low lights because this is why what fourth trip maybe fifth trip to hfes and i i don't know i've kind of noticed a lot and and maybe it's just me because uh we've we've been stuck in a podcast booth the entire time but say like like it's a bad thing yeah yeah no let's (laughs) let me be clear like we have had an amazing opportunity to meet a lot of really interesting people but i feel like the thing that i have gotten out of hfes most in the past is the networking opportunities and it almost feels this year like the networking opportunities are coming to us we have listeners stopping by the booth we have uh great names in the field stopping by the booth and i almost feel on one hand like it's a like a like it's handed to me on a golden platter and i don't have to work for it and i don't know if that's a low light but it certainly like it doesn't have the same vibe yeah i don't know because this is the this is truly the first hfes i've ever come to like i went to one early when i was when i was still a graduate student but it was the second hfes that you've been to yeah but like the first (laughs) one i really only was there to volunteer for one day to help write the newsletter i didn't go to any sessions i just basically wrote part of the newsletter and left and that was kind of it because like i had school and whatnot so this is my first experience here and it's been a little little kind of overwhelming i mean talking to people that you would read their papers in graduate school right um i don't know it's been good overall yeah from a student perspective it really is kind of overwhelming when you talk to someone who's written the textbook that you studied from in one of your classes or it's like there's this kind of this and you might be able to speak to this too there's kind of this lingering feeling in the back of your head like Am I going to ask an intelligent question? Like, I think this is an intelligent question, but we am I going to make all day? Am oh, I going to make yeah. a fool out of myself in front of this person? Like, what is this going to be like? I think in half the podcast interviews, I'm nearly silent because of that reason. Like, oh, <laughs> it's this like, like me sound like an idiot. Here, I don't want to sound. Well, well it, actually, I have a question for you guys. <clears throat> given this, that you're doing these podcasts with incredible people like Micah Ensley today, like that was yeah. incredible. Um, just kind of curious. Like, you you had talked a little bit about this earlier of, of you know treating them like they're just everyday people because they really are and um but how how has that worked how have you gone around 
having those conversations and getting it open up. And um, you use dumb words to make them try to explain things to you because they think you're dumb. That's the trick. No, honestly, no. honestly, <laughs> but you're not. You're not people. <laughs> honestly, the 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 trick is talking to these people like they are people, and also trying to get them to understand who our audience is. They're familiar with human factors, and this they might not be familiar with their topic, but th- there's a whole preamble that our listeners are not getting that I that we give to them prior to interview. It's like. You know, how do you want to be addressed? Here's our audience, and this, this is the type of language that you should be using. Um, and I think sitting down with them and, and explaining to them that it's a conversational tone and that the more human you can sound, the more people will kind of relate to them and potentially drive interest in their topics. <laughs> but one thing that Nick did a really good job about was, one, like talking these people through like what we're going to do. And we had sent them base questions beforehand, so it made it really easy. They knew the ones who read it anyway, knew what they were going to be talking about. But <laughs> the ones who responded. I think we Nick really set the tone with the very first interview by asking kind of like a goofy, or starting it off with a goofy line about how dorky the conference was. And so it made the first interview we had super comfortable. They were laughing. They're having a good time. They're really engaged with us. So that I think that really helped facilitate the rest of the conversations. Even though I, I like, in Micah's... Uh, interview today like i know what situation awareness is but maybe someone who's listening may not be familiar so i have an excuse to ask that question right i have an excuse to define what is situation awareness what like in your words what what is hsi that was another one that came up that i'm familiar with right and i asked them to define it because i know not everyone is familiar with this with this terminology and um you know i i don't know i have a i have a weird thing with communication like blake you and i are communicators now Woodrow too. We are communicators on this podcast and we have to put things in a way that people understand. We have to mm. we have to talk about these concepts at these sort of low levels that, that not to dumb them down but just to communicate the concept, right? Like some of these things that we talk about on a weekly show, it's it's kind of confusing, especially when you don't have vid- video to go with it, which is part of the reason why we went to the video format was to provide these visual aids, but Also, we have to describe these things in detail. We have to um, describe what methods they used. And we do that in very simple terms. We're not very scientific about it because it's not our project. We don't have to be to the T, this is what I'm reporting. We say, yeah, they they took 35 people and they ran them through these two tests and that was it. And, you know, if, if people are curious, they can go check more. And I don't know, I communication is so weird. And I think it's um, it's a problem. I, I think it's a real problem. And this is kind of getting into a criticism I have of leadership just in the past, not now. I'm, I, let me be clear. I think the leadership in HFES now understands that there's some sort of communication problem with the millennial generation, with the younger generation in HFES. I mean, Valerie Rice was not afraid to talk about retention rates and the the organization as a whole is experiencing that as a challenge why is that is everybody using fancy words that intimidates younger folks are they not keeping up to date with things there's a lot of things that we can dig into here but communication i think is key and i I heard some rumblings i'm not going to name names or anything like that but i heard some rumblings that there are conversations at the top that are going on about that too like hey talk to people and try to communicate these concepts effectively so i don't know it's out there yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree, and um, I will I will echo that statement, which is um, I got to attend the I got to fill in for uh, our good buddy Frank Laxon. So I got to sit in on the uh, local chapter's president luncheon um, yesterday, and it actually was extremely informative because uh, a lot of the chapters are having the exact same problems, which is they're having a really hard time with getting people to come to these local events, and and we know this, right? I mean, we we did the right. SDG and E which is the San Diego um, Gas and Electric Company Innovation Center tour. We did we do technical tours, and we had five people. Five um, people show up, and all four, of San Diego County, and four of them are on the board. Um, so so right. and, and but we're not the only ones. I found out a lot of people are having issues with getting um, professionals to to do these kinds of um, outreach programs and, and getting involved with that. So they're actually um, and Kermit was was there and he was talking about what can I do for you to get this going? And they're actually really um, yeah. getting progressive. They have a lot of great ideas. Um, webinars, 
uh, having uh, joint sessions, a lot of collaboration. Uh, as far as you know, if, if somebody has a, a speaker coming, they want to set up telecons and um, telepresence um, to kind of do these webinars so that other chapters can actually come together and watch these presentations as well. So one speaker might only go to one chapter, but it'll be presented to all the chapters across the nation. Um, so I think they're really starting to embrace that technology and realizing um, how we can use that for our benefit. I also think something important to think about from the HFES perspective and the local tra chapter perspective is to really start taking like some hints from what the UX community has done, oh. like like UXPLA yep. or like UX Speakeasy in San Diego. Yep. Like they have all their stuff is run through Meetup. They're well yep. marketed. It's it's like it started off as like basically let's let's get together and talk about a UX and have a lot of drinks. And that's I think that's something that can help, like really just having fun time to get together and just enjoy company of people you potentially might work with or work in the same field. Uh, they, they, uh, sorry to interrupt. No, no, I just no, have to fine. say they, they brought up that exact exact thing. Um, it, it, like multiple people at that lunch, luncheon said, UX people, they're doing it right. I mean, they're 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 they have tons, hundreds of people showing up for their <clears> events. And how are we not part of this? How are we not taking advantage of this? To where, I mean, if we think about it in a broad scope, right? UX falls under human factors. I mean, it really does, right? I mean, yeah. the grand it, it, really exactly happen. in the grand scheme of things. So why are we not taking advantage of of this opportunity? And I think that was really what was coming across is we need to do a better job um, as practitioners, as people in the in human factors community, to uh, get this collaboration with these UX people who clearly are doing it right. I mean, the meetups and everything, especially in San Diego. I mean, we're talking hundreds of people, right, at these at these UX events. Yeah, in I mean, San it's, Diego. it's I mean, a pretty it's, big turnout. And like, if I'm not going to name the name of the organization, but in LA, there's a UX group that also like they're turning a pretty big profit by putting on these workshops and yeah. it's, it's drawing enough attention because you're learning skills at the events you go to, not just networking or not just like going for a happy hour. Right. So I think that's a lot of the benefit too, is like providing all those means, like get to know people in your community, of course, get to understand projects that are going on and then also learn some skills. Yeah. So as an early professional, um, <laughs> I'm going to be going into professions in January. So it's really exciting to join industry. Um, Welcome. Thank I thank you, uh, thank you for your welcome. Um, I'm no, I'm really excited, and I, I'm going to be joining the UX industry. And I would agree, like it, it just it feels more vibrant. It feels like it's it's ready and waiting for you, and it's not as scary as it may seem to like go live on your own and take care of yourself. And um, I was living in Minneapolis this summer, and the Adobe Creative Jam was happening. And this is where I was going to say is I think where UX ended up thriving really well is that these tech industries were embracing it and deciding to value human-centered design, value human factors, actually just compete in our competitions. Bailey, we have you here um, because you are an undergrad. <laughs> and I, I want to kind of touch on your experience here. We're trying to get a survey of the varying viewpoints of, you know, we have undergrad up through, we'll have a senior scientist here later, potentially. Um, so we're, we're trying to get, we'll have this wide range of experience and varying points in their careers. And so um, the point of this is to kind of provide those varying viewpoints to someone who may not be able to attend the conference. Uh, so I want to know what, what has the conference been like for you? This is only, this is only day one for you, but it's day three for all of us. What has your experience been like so far? Um, so now this is my first day and my, my second year coming here. And what I would say is, um, I touched on it earlier in the podcast, is there was a couple sessions where I was like falling asleep in them. Um, and I feel really bad. Um, but at the same time, um, we should be about engagement and, and really getting people excited about what we study. Um, and what I would say is I've been to smaller conferences that are related to human-centered design. And this one is definitely oriented in a very professional way. So I feel like it's worth my time to come here. It's worth my time to take off school, which is why I couldn't come here for the first two days. Um, and I just, I wish like people on the other end. So I want to see the intersection of industry getting involved more in human factors and ergonomic society because there is a large contribution of, of consumerism 
that people touch on but that aren't necessarily talked about at these conferences. So I think it's great that like Google and YouTube and all, IBM and, and all these other companies are coming here to start having that conversation with, the, with academia. Um, and I'd love to see more intersection between the two. I ran into a guy today, and he said he's having a presentation on this on Friday. So oh. it'll be interesting. I wish it was going to be on Friday to go to that and yeah. ask questions. Because that, that you're making a really good point. I mean, one thing I wanted to ask you, because we had talked about this earlier before we did one of the interviews. So what about either the presentation, and hopefully it'll change as we go to different presentations, but what could have changed or been made different that would have kept your attention? Was it just the subject and it, you thought you'd be interested in it, but it turned out like, ah, just this isn't really for me? Or did it have to do with like what Logan was talking about, like a very you know, good presentation versus a little bit of a lackluster presentation. Yeah. So I was trying to think of some like convoluted way of answering your question. Um, but I think it's really simple and it, it comes down to communication. Yes. We have these booklets that explain what's going to be talked about at these sessions. Um, and you read them and it's a lot like how I ended up in my major right now. I read the website. I was like, I'm so pumped. This is exactly what I wanted. And then I got there and I was like, this is not at all what I wanted. <laughs> I think the, the sessions are great. Human Factors and Ergonomic Society does a great job at um, kind of vetting who's going to be coming and talk to the, talking to these sessions. Um, but maybe, maybe a more effort on their end, making sure that these sessions are engaging. Um, like, for instance, um, in about a month, I'm going to be going to the North East Media Literacy Conference um, to talk about a, a side project that I work on. Um, but they've been hassling me once a week. What are you going to be talking about? Is it going to be engaging? What you sent me isn't engaging, so you can't present. And, and they said, and that's what they said. So if you, and you have this deadline to make. So it's like they really want people to be engaged at those at the conference. So I'll let you know in a month if, if it actually worked. But. That'd be great, actually, if you yeah. can follow up with us on how that actually goes. Because yeah. that process is something similar I've seen in, like, UX conferences that I've been a part of, is when we send out, like, calls for papers or presentations. Like, it's it's a lot of getting on people about, like, hey, this just this isn't what we're looking for. And if you can't, like, meet these standards, we're just not going to have you in the conference. Mm-hmm. Bailey, I want to get your thoughts on – so you and I both attended this Me and My VE earlier. Mm-hmm. And um, was that engaging to you? Oh, it was awesome. Okay, okay, good. Okay, I so, thought it was really cool. <laughs> we can nerd out about this. No, no, no. So this one, um, just a premise for the yeah. audience as well. It, it was on um, VR and augmented reality. Um, and they were like, we can't exactly present on this. Like, one guy was like, this is my only slide. <laughs> yeah. I have one slide. And he's like, but come over and talk to me after. Because I have some really cool stuff I want to show you. And yeah. I found that to be a lot. So the format of this was, was a little bit, it's... I don't know if they call it alternative format. I, I think they did, call did it they call that, it alternative uh, yeah. format? Um, and I think they've been experimenting with these alternative formats, which we can get into a whole other discussion on sort of the uh, effectiveness of these things and what come out of these. Cause Blake and I've had some candid conversations about this aside, but the, the format of this me and my VE session was basically there were seven presenters and all of them had to keep their presentation to five minutes. So they had to condense their entire research premise into five minutes. And within that five minutes, they had to intrigue, explain, and entice their audience members to, um, one, be interested in the topic, two, understand the domain that they're working in, and three, be intrigued enough to go to one of the demo stations that lined the inside of that room. So there were seven demo stations lining the inside of that room. And after the 35 minutes were up for seven presenters, you had an hour of time to go and experience these different things. And I think that type of format, at least for me, was really interesting because it offered a lot more than you can get from just looking at a PowerPoint. And that kind of goes to what Logan was saying earlier about the whole, um, you know, engaging presentations. I think there's something to be said also about short and sweet content. Yeah. I, I mean, I almost have to play devil's advocate on this and please do. I, you need that. 
I know. So I I do agree with you that it that our attention spans are getting worse, um, and, and I completely understand that. But at the same time, and and I had the same exact um, conversation at a luncheon today for the SDTG, the System Development Technical Group. They're actually going to um, make a suggestion that for their talks next year um, to reduce the number of people in their their sessions. Oh. Um, and, and here's the reason why. So instead of maybe having five people to present for 18 minutes, have four people. Um, and Along the session will be the same. Oh, well, the, the, the time per person. Exactly. So okay. instead of 18 minutes, you have like 23. And, and the rationale is these people, I mean, uh, they're spending uh, six months, years on these presentations, on their, their work, on their seminal work, right? And they're expected to convey the concepts that they're trying to do in 18 minutes. I mean, that's like, that's like trying to explain to, to people what we do in, in three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there, there just isn't that enough time to really go into it. However, I do understand on the flip side that given more time, to be able to engage with them on a, at a longer basis is actually going to be a lot more difficult um, because I, I do absolutely agree that I think that engagement part is really um, something that needs to be worked on. Well, look, some of the most compelling TED Talks are 22 minutes long. Oh, I love TED Talks. So, yeah. I, I mean, look, like yes. it's, it's, it's a matter of how you present, and maybe yeah. if you elongate the time, then people will be uh, more comfortable with perhaps doing it in the same amount of time but allowing – more time for questions because that's yeah. that's something that often comes up. I also think that the me and my VE was a unique sort of instance where the concepts couldn't be conveyed through the use of a PowerPoint. I yeah. mean, you could try to show some 3D modeling, but without putting on the HoloLens and experiencing the the stuff in you know real life, it's it's kind of hard to to yeah. conceptualize. All right, I want to get to some highlights. What is like the best thing that you guys have done while you're here at the conference? Blake, we'll start with you. Oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah, it's honestly, Nick, it was sitting down with like two people who I've spent a lot of time having to read their papers and talk about them and regurgitate the science that they had done. So like talking to Mike Ensley and talking to Nancy Cook were definitely two of my highlights. As far as like the rest of the conference outside of the podcast stuff we had done, um, probably going to the plenary sessions and then this morning going to the diversity panel session because i thought it, it's it's something that we have to deal with like not just in hfes but across a lot of organizations and it's good that it's it's being talked about at least here even though like the the turnout was pretty small but it, at the end of the day it was still good that it's being brought up and which is it, the turnout to me was incredibly disappointing for a variety of reasons key point being uh diversity is necessary and the fact that for whatever reason people didn't find it worth it to go to this panel uh was really upsetting to me personally um i to me i think here's one criticism is that some of these sessions where they are discussion panels and and Blake and I have talked about this offline but bringing it to our audience now one criticism I have is that a lot of times there's these discussion panels and it seems like the only purpose there is to, to talk with others in the field. And well, what comes of these? There's never any action items there. You know, that they've taken notes. What are they going to do with those? Like what, what are the next steps and, and what can we get out of these things? And I, I don't know, maybe it sparks an idea in someone who attended, but it just feels to me, like there's not really a purpose to some of these discussion panels other than to have the discussion in a public forum. Yeah. And it's one of those things that I, I wish I had gone to a couple of discussion panels to kind of sample what was going on. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this is something we, you and I have talked about at length and at the very least, like there was a specific panel that I'm, I'm just not going to mention the name of it, but there was, there was one that was talked about recently that it was like, it sounded probably a really interesting conversation and that there was action items coming out of it but what was going to be done with them and the, the thing you and i've talked about at nauseam is like these things should be recorded and they should be disseminated to the community yeah and so that's one sort of big 
another criticism. Here we go with all the criticisms. But honestly, so like for the highlights, Nick. Part of our I know so much highlights. Right? I, I have a positive coming out. What's the What's the positive? Let's get to that first. Um, tomorrow <laughs> is Women in Human Factors. Yes, Day. it is. So yes, it is. I would say that they did. They didn't have those last year. So let's hope there's a bigger turnout <laughs> for that. Well, I mean, still the diversity turnout was disappointing, but let's hope there's a big turnout for women. Yeah, I mean, I it's all day, um, so there's multiple yeah. sessions going on, and um, this I think might have been a, an outcome from last year's discussion from the diversity committee that they had. Nice, so, which I don't think they have this year. So I don't know. I <laughs> thought experiments. Another another criticism I have is just that that you and I, Blake, we we have adopted this. Um, idea that when we when we discuss human factors the the conference we want to bring this to everyone who can't be here yeah. because it it truly is the knowledge that you get here uh from the panels and everything else the posters the papers that's one thing and i just don't understand why the community doesn't want to share videos of these uh presentations because if you were to stream this conference i guarantee you people from around the world would tune in they would be engaged they would tune in for specific panels um and you could get some hard metrics associated with them to see what performed well what did not perform well what to invest in for next year and also you're sharing knowledge with the world the thing that you get from being here that you don't get from watching abroad is sort of the ability to network you know having these conversations perhaps with the people that are putting on these things getting to see virtual reality in in these other panels maybe perhaps asking questions those are the things that you're not getting if you're watching from abroad but if we can provide them with some sort of way to at least watch at least listen we're making big pushes to try to get this out there i mean i think ted talk does that right like exactly TED Talks do it. yeah why why and, can't we broadcast like ted now the conversations are in the classroom like and and at work like ted talks are shared all over the place so you, yeah you can start a movement not all presentations are going to be hits but there There's will be one form of a presentation is a presentation and a presentation exactly <laughs> not all of them will be hits but there will be some that like for it's a solid presentation and if people know they're going to be broadcast they might put a little bit more effort into being engaging that that conversation that we had earlier i don't know maybe i'm biased because we put on this weekly show where we talk about these things but Honestly, I think a lot of good can come from disseminating this information in non-traditional media to help the outreach. I, I think that, so when I attended Kai earlier this year, they did all of that. And yeah. I think, I mean, they were spot on. Every single session that I was at, they had it broadcast. They had it streaming. They had awesome things going on where people that couldn't make it and attend could actually um, log in and see all these presentations live. Um, and I think that that is absolutely the way that they need to go. And I think they are going in that direction on a micro level. Um, so like I said, in that, in that, um, in that luncheon that I had for the, the presidents, um, the local chapters, they do want to get a lot of those, um, those presentations, uh, shared, uh, throughout, right. They want to get, they want to get more, um, uh, collaboration. And so I think that, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, Sharing it with people that aren't able to, to make it, I think, is an absolutely great thing. You could do other engagement <laughs> methods with a with a digital distribution as well, right? Uh, the provide, app. Provide, Dude, they already have yeah. the app, right? They already yeah. have a format. Why well, don't they just integrate all this to the app? Exactly. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You click you could, on the yeah. session in the app, and, and you then could, you get to watch it. I bet you'll it. get yeah. a better response if you do it physically. Yeah. Oh, the rating no. thing for sure. I, I yeah. absolutely – yeah, I agree. But what if you are – what if they are Quality, streaming maybe it? maybe not quantity. Right? Yeah. Then how would you be able to rate that if you were streaming? Then you could you could also offer that as well. Oh um, yeah. So so there yeah. are again different formats, right? You have to think of different formats of how you're trying to present this information. I think that could be a really cool way. Now it could get expensive if you're talking about. I mean, how many different rooms are there right now? I mean, there's like thirty different rooms, right? Or twenty. But still, that investment I feel like could be instrumental for for um, 
uh, helping with uh, revamping or not revamping, but improving the, the process and, and how this goes. Yeah. Cause I mean, if you think about it from a business perspective, it should be like short term, high cost, of course, but long term, that would really benefit you, especially Absolutely. if you're disseminating it across all of your social media, that's got yeah. a lot of ROI. And if you start dropping stuff on YouTube and you've got enough subs to market, plus, and, you know, plus you could do a design to- challenge on how to design that interface. Yeah. So it could be a student design competition for how to design that information that then could be showcased at the next HFES 19 in Seattle. I'm just, I'm putting that out there to HFES. I think that they need to do a design challenge for, for a feedback system for every single panel. Um, and I think that that would be awesome to get students involved um, to, to do that. And, yeah. and if you give them a year, I think that's more than enough time to, to do that, to do the design challenge and to have actually something up and running by next year. I feel like that's a good challenge for local chapters to take on is to have their own hackathon. Yeah, we talked yeah. about that yeah, actually um, about having hackathons. So that could be. So uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and pick this back up where we left off, which was highlights. Um, highlights. Because I, I really, um, some of the highlights, it, at least for, I, I didn't go last year. I went to uh, 2016 in D.C. Um, and that was my first time as a professional um, in the workforce. And, and it was very different because I didn't know quite, where I, where I was at, what I was doing. So, um, and, and now I really feel like um, uh, the networking aspect here um, really is key. Uh, at least for me, that was the absolute yeah. highlight. Is I have I have run into so many um, people that I've I've worked with over the years. Um, you know, people I've done internships with. Um, you know, uh, people that I've worked with. Uh, people that I've gone to school with. And everything like that. And it's just so fun to, to come and be able to uh, see those people again. Because as, as you guys probably know, um, I'm not a very social person. Um, I, I will admit I'm a, a an, somewhat anti-social-ite. If you're will. talking to two other antisocial um, people, yeah. but but we're the that, people that sat in the corner of the bar at the UX happy hour <laughs> just took the free drink. <laughs> but but it's, it's it's this is a different forum. I feel like I mean it's just not it's 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 a very more personal um, interaction with people, which I feel like I I do really well at. Um, it's that whole. Um, I, I have issues with kind of non personal interactions. Um, hey, accept me on on LinkedIn. I don't know who you are. Um, I've never seen you before. Uh, why would I accept you? It, you just don't see those those kinds of interactions anymore, and and that's really why I, I do enjoy these conferences. Um, you get to go out, and I mean, in the last year, how many times have we actually, the three of us, actually gone out and hung out outside of work? Maybe zero. Exactly. Yeah. That's once? what I'm saying. Maybe once. once. Maybe once. Yeah. And probably once. Maybe once. And so here, right, we get the chance to actually go out, sit hang down, out, hang sit out. down, have a beer. And, and the last thing I just want to say for the for the highlights for me is I, I, I got the chance to be on a, um, a committee or a panel, I guess, um, for the transition from student to professional work. And for me, that, that was the absolute highlight for me. Um, for me, I, I've really found that I, I actually do have a, a, a real passion for trying to help um, people transition to the real world. Um, which, which I really do think is lacking in our institutions. Um, and lack uh, of support for sure. Lack of support. And, and just uh, as someone who is a very non-traditional student, I mean, I'll be completely honest. I dropped out. I basically failed out when I was 21 cause I was too interested in partying. I feel so bad for a lot of these people coming out of these, out of these grad programs or even undergrad, right. Who go straight through school, go high school to college, college to graduate school. I mean, you're talking, you have not, uh, some of these people literally have never had a single job and they're 25, right. 26 coming out into the workforce. And there is not a single thing that anyone has done for them to help them prepare them for the real world. And I, I think that's, that's a serious lack. And so I, I I've been trying to make a, a conscious effort to really, to really push myself to, to help out in any ways I can, um, to kind of just help people out. It's, it's purely, um, you know, I'm, I'm a philanthropic highlights for me. Um, I would have to say the interviews. I mean, I know that's mm-hmm. like a, a cop out almost yeah, because it's kind of, it's something. Yeah, I know. Well, I'll, I'll get to other Soft. stuff. <laughs> it, it is. Let's, let's start there. So the interviews have been really great. I think, um, it's been a great opportunity and honor and privilege to talk to some of these individuals, uh, 
honestly, because it's helped us grow for sure. Uh, not just with numbers or listeners or whatever that that's not important. The, the thing that's important is that it's, it's helping communicate information across to potentially those who aren't here to listen to it. We're talking about the things that they are here for. So Micah, we didn't talk to her about situation awareness. We mentioned right. it briefly in her background, right? We talked to her about her being the chair of the government relation committee Yeah, because that is what she's currently doing. Yep. And she's probably talked situation awareness to death. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're talking to other people too, right? Keith Fawcett has a lot of experience, but we wanted to talk to him about the Alfaro because that was what he was here for. Diversity panelists. We wanted to talk to them about diversity. So, these are very short, truncated versions of the plenary talks, the things that are going on here. And I think it's really cool to get that sampling in a way that's very direct with the people that are responsible for it. The other sort of highlight, I think, for me at least, is is that these interviews have helped me grow professionally. Like, I've never done interviews. Prof- like, we did, a, we did the uh, test with Philippe yep. a couple months ago. Yeah. That was the first real interview we've done. And so now that was like a test run for this type of format. And I think being able to actively listen to what the other person is saying and also engage with questions that you think people listening on the other end might want to know like that to me has been a, a, a big point of growth just in the last three days. Um, so that's one highlight. So there you have it. That was our. Uh, we kind of left on. Uh, there, there's one highlight, and then that was it. But, one highlight that we had. <laughs> yeah. But that was our uh, conversation from HFES 2018. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, like I said, it was kind of just five of us hanging out in a hotel room talking about the conference and other things too, um, which uh, hopefully translated well into a, a a nice bonus episode about what the conference was for us and and you know what kind of experiences we had. Yeah, definitely let us know what you thought of this episode because it, it is still a little bit different than the typical format of how we would cover like HFES or the healthcare symposium, but it's something we'd like to do more of in the future because I thought it was great to catch a lot of diverse perspectives like from Nick, myself, and Woodrow being people that actively work in the field that can actually do a podcast all about human factors and then plus having people that are still in school learning about human factors and UX design. So I'm yeah. interested to hear what everybody thinks. Yeah, we definitely tried to capture uh, all different angles there with that um, with that audio, with the podcast. I don't even know what to call it. It was a, we, we were even calling it in the room a bonus thing because uh, we didn't, it didn't feel like a bonus episode. It felt like a conversation that we were all having about the conference. And anyway, I mean, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that bonus content. Uh, like, like Blake said, please let us know what you think of it. Um, Hopefully, we're, we're hoping, like we said earlier, that, that we can continue to do the coverage that you've known uh, that we can produce going forward in the future. Uh, you know, when maybe we'll schedule some time to go to some panels that we like, but uh, this year just didn't pan out. But I hope you found some some sort of uh, useful tidbits from, from Logan and Bailey who were able to attend some, some panels. Um, you know what, though? I, I really have nothing else. I think this was a fun bonus episode. It was, a, it was great for us. Just hanging out in a hotel room talking to human factors. Exactly. Can't <laughs> get any better than that. All right. So with that, we will check in with you guys next time. Uh, our bonus coverage continues in uh, next month, November, for AHFES. HFESA. There we go. Got it. <laughs> HFES Australia in Perth. All right. Join us then for more bonus coverage. Until then, you can find us weekly here on Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It, it depends. depends.